Top of the afternoon to you ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. We're at the bench in the shop for another little narrative session. I'm going to throw the disclaimers out in the beginning. This is going to be long and tedious if you're not a knuckle slash gearhead. I possess both of those qualities, but I think it's 90% knuckle and 10% gear, unfortunately for me. So, with that being said, if you aren't said knuckle slash gearhead you're probably not going to enjoy this process whatsoever you're not going to find it interesting you're not going to find it noteworthy you're not going to find it impressive i will be using impressive probably a lot in this video impressive doesn't mean good or bad necessarily um it could mean one or the other uh, i just kind of wanted to throw that out there um Check the description for any clarifications and or qualifications. I'm only human in this life. I make mistakes more so than anybody else that I know. And I have to correct myself on occasion with the miscues that I actually do. So, my NBFF, he got his panties, like I don't even know what happened there, but he bought this saw on a whim, I think it was. Yeah, buddy, three under the bus there. And uh, anyway, he wanted to do something with this saw. Uh, I can't even actually remember if he ran this thing, to be honest with you. It looked pretty much brand new when I got it, but that was multiple saw projects ago, and I actually don't really remember. So, I could because I didn't try to. So carrying on with that, after I got my little digs in there and thrown the guy under the bus a little bit, um. I'm super thankful that he sent this saw to me in all reality. Um, uh, everybody's kind of been talking about it, and I don't know. They have some good things to say. I found the thing to be underpowered on a personal level. I really like the fact that it's really narrow, though. Um, it's a very narrow saw. It's kind of a little bit long for running, like... You know, a 28, from my perspective, I like the 60cc saws because they're more maneuverable when you get around in a brush hole and you're running a 28, you can maneuver a little bit better. Um, and I can make any of the 60cc saws out, cut this thing so it doesn't even matter, at least in stock form. And so, on a personal level, I would be, because of the weight of this saw, it comes in around... I think the last time I weighed this, it was 16.8. I've seen a couple of times where it came in at 17. Um, that's fully laden with gas and oil because who cares what it weighs empty. You're not using it in the empty form. Um, but I took it out in the wilds a little bit, and I it drives nice. Let's just say that. It's long. The handlebar spacing is good. Once I get a... They don't make this in the W version. It's a CS7310P, not PW. I called the tech people, actually was able to tap in and get the parts catalog off the website. And so I made a little folder for, actually made one for myself. But then I wanted the gentleman who owns this saw, I wanted him to have one as well. So I made them at the same time, essentially, got them both taken care of that way. But it, basically, it's the IPL, essentially. So while I was on the phone with the tech guy, had an interesting conversation. They're not making the wrap for this saw anytime soon. It didn't sound like I was kind of like in my normal inquisitive mind in the back. And then it actually came out my mouth. Uh, why not? Um, are you guys, what's the target market for this? It's obvious not the West Coast because they're not going after timber falling. I tried to explain to him, everybody buys wrap saws out on the West Coast for the most part. In big kid saws, this is a 73.5 cc saw. It's considered, you kind of get into that big kid saw size. So I just thought that was really odd. So a lot of dialogue in the beginning. Um... I didn't do any research on this saw whatsoever as far as bore and stroke. Um, a couple people have mentioned that it's 51 by 36. That would make it the 73 and a half, I guess. I wanted to just 
be unbiased in this process. I did get the carburetor a little bit so I could tune it a little bit better on the very last run. We saw this going against an 044 and losing. And the 044, I wouldn't say it's pristine. It has some time. I wouldn't say it has um, new saw compression. And this saw was still lagging. They seem like they're running pretty lean to me off the bottom. With any luck, I'll be able to figure out how to make it respond and do some work to it. So, we've talked a lot about the process. And now I guess maybe we should take a look under the hood. So, the first thing I did when I got this was I actually looked underneath here myself because I was curious what all the hoopla was about in the air cleaner system. And straight away, I'm going to warn you, if you buy one of these, do not tip this thing upside down because these screws or their quarter twist lock screws essentially they fall out of the cover i lost it in the gravel and took a while to find it but for whatever reason they have a pretty good size screw and then they have all these washers um not a weight savings operation so i thought that was there we go. Interesting. Coming out of the gate, right out of the gate. But the air filtration system is kind of interesting. You can see they're capturing, uh, they're doing like an air injection concept that um, Husqvarna has been doing for eons, still adopted that from them. I actually heard there was a bunch of scuttlebutt, they got sued. I'm not sure if that's actually accurate. But a lot of the steel saws are trying to pressurize the plumb in there uh, around the air cleaner as well. And so this saw is following suit. Now, one of the things I thought about because of the way this is getting pressurized, um, I wondered if it's possible to be a problem when you get an elevation. We're about 2,800 feet. I know that some of the Amtronic saws will be struggling, 661s. At this elevation, when the temperature gets to be around 80, they're struggling. Um, just don't even take them out of the truck. If you're going to go to 5,000 feet around here, you're not going to be happy or impressed with the way those saws run. I actually said something to the tech guy. He was telling me how I was full of baloney, but I've had saws at 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, whatever. That guy has not, and so... It's kind of how that goes sometimes but anyway back on track I have noticed that this filter does stay nice and clean it has some dirt over here where there looks to be um, a recess that comes out from underneath right over here underneath in where the carb box where the carb is underneath the basically the filter base i'm assuming with that what maybe they call this i'm not sure without looking at the ipl but there's a fair amount of build up right there but everywhere else pretty it's pretty nice actually for the amount of time that i've run this thing it doesn't have much build up at all. i think we're on like the fourth tank or something maybe One of the things I was really curious about is the squish in this operation. And see, we had the sooner cover upside down looking at it, and we lost another one of those screws. So like I said, you kind of got to be watchful, especially if you're out in the bush and you take that thing apart. It's going to be a little bit of a problem if you lose those screws out in the bush, if you will. Um, they have a standard 14 by one 1.0 1 um, plug in them they actually have the good stuff BPMR 8Y-5 so I thought that was kind of interesting I don't know if you're going to be able to see this I just noticed it's got the little V in the positive side of the electrode I don't know if you're able to see that but essentially there is a V in the middle right there. 
So they got the high dollar plug in this thing. So that doesn't give it an excuse to run bad. It should be running actually really well. So if we check the squish real quick, because like I said, I haven't at any time monkeying around with this saw. Um, wow. Maximum amount of distance. So that's one of the reasons why it doesn't have any power at elevation right there. The squish is really huge. And I have a large collection of tools out here because I was unclear on what I was actually going to need to make this session possible. So now we'll try it again with a lot thicker piece of... Actually, we better verify we got that out past the end of the last machine that I checked. This is kind of amazing. Okay, we're going for thicker yet. Now obviously I've squished a few saws because I have multiple choices of solder. Wow. That's oh, utterly amazing. We'll get it off of Mickey Mouse and on to American. It looks about 62 thousandths. That's why this thing is getting run over by everything that I've tested it with. Essentially, the squish band is really huge, and so it's not doing a very good job atomizing the fuel in there, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what's going on in there, except it's not running very well. Um, so the squish band is over 60 thousandths that's a lot for a saw that's probably one of the main reasons why this saw is struggling at elevation to run very good now one of the things I forgot to talk about in the beginning when I um, was being a little bit of a smart mouth so back on the array of tools that say because I didn't really know I have my scalpel I have my forceps and I have my clamps so I came prepared to do whatever it takes to get this saw whipped into shape. Now, we're running 27 Torx. I did notice that because I was kind of pussing around with um, trying to come up with a wrap system for the handlebars. And they use metal screw inserts because we can see that the screws are not plastic they go into their machine thread thought that was kind of interesting they were really almost impossible to get apart I don't know what kind of toxic waste they're using for Loctite but it was impressive now one of the things I did to this saw was I put on a set of dogs that I kind of thought might work and then I took it out on a little road trip, killed a few trees for my buddy Scott. They seem to work okay for the power of this saw. That would be what I kind of came to as far as conclusion went, as far as actually testing it in the field. Um, The handlebars are pretty big in diameter. They're kind of like Husqvarna-esque. And one thing, you got to be careful of the little inserts 
in the end okay this one's secured with the screw that limits it from moving which the screw is anchored right here in the side of the case um if you smash your handlebars make sure you keep this part because that's a separate part if you need to order new ones So if we're going to continue the saga of tearing this thing down, um, one thing I did notice is I, Husqvarna has a similar system where they mount the spring. That's actually on the back side of the cylinder, which I kind of like the way they're designed. But they have a little stop in here, so when you're tightening up the screw that holds the spring mount anti-vibe to the handlebar it doesn't allow it to move i actually kind of like that design concept on this saw so yeah we got that taken apart we want to take a look at this cartridge style filter for a second so we can see there's some Particulate matter over on this side right here on this filter base. That's actually kind of rubberized. So there's this little plastic lip that's molded in the bottom of this element. And we can see there's some crap right there from it kind of getting around the corner. Um, I'm not really sure why when everybody's raving about how awesome this filter system is we would be looking at dirt or actually sawdust technically that was basically getting a little bit too far past that rubber ceiling surface right there there's a little bit of crap down in that little recess right there so um, is it a good filter system? I guess so. Is it awesome? Yeah, I don't know yet. It doesn't seem like it was holding up very good right there. I mean, if I had to be completely honest. So they have a little clamp that holds the fuel line. Oh, that's the pulse line, I guess, technically. Fuel line's over here. They use a clear fuel line. A lot of times, those yellow ones or the orange ones or the clear ones are a little more impervious to fuel. Um, this is interesting how it just lays in there. Um, I know that the actuation of this... Um, choke the way they have it set up is is really easy it's really nice um at the same time if you get a twig stuck underneath there i could see where they can actually like mess with your choke um i've seen them get underneath those old husqvarna ones that are a little tiny with the hole had a little uh round spot where you could grab them there was open and in between and you could get a twig in there and sh you basically you choke yourself out um so I can see that happening on this because it moves so easy. The actuation is really lightweight, like a hair trigger. We want to look at the the one thing that I wasn't really super impressed with in some of this operation when I worked on that 620 is the rubber that they use seems it seems fragile to me. It's like flimsy. Um this is really squishy. Steel uses something almost a carbon copy, and theirs are actually kind of beef compared to this. So, um, yeah, I'm not overly impressed with that. We're going to um, reboot here for a second and get a little air hose action going.
Okay, so one of the other things I just noticed is the vent actually flops around inside there. Uh, you probably can't see that. Um, if we look at, there's the top of the, I'm assuming that's the tank vent. And so I'm hoping that you can see that right there. Um, that's interesting. Again, interesting can mean multiple things in this process. Dolmar special tool. They use Loctite on this screw. You cannot get a regular T handle down in there, I don't think. They won't fit, so you have to use the special Dolmar version. I like the way they've done it. It's kind of like what Husqvarna has been dealing with. They don't have a bunch of the surface area like the steels have their uh, top four or five fins down like, I don't know, they're down 15 or 20 percent on surface area and that's where all the cooling should be happening. Um, I like this design where it's back and you're not really compromising the size of the fins and this cylinder is kind of Dolmar-esque it's really small um, if you want to look at like the 7900 or whatever for an 80 virtually 80 cc saw I think they're 78.5 or something has a really small cylinder so I thought that was kind of interesting the other thing that's kind of cool is you can see the redirection there's a little vein that comes off of this tube directing airflow out over this way so and they have a cooling plate on there you can see it right there this is interesting right here with these fins they're probably trying to uh, keep the heat at a minimum from getting onto the carburetor that would be my guess um, if I had to guess we'll get rid of some pressure See what we get taking the fuel line off of there. We get like it's impressive, it's like on there nicely, actually, is what we get. Interesting little spring thing and again back on the rubber this is the pulse it feels it doesn't feel the same kind of quality as what we see in steel and husk varnish saws and even like the Dolmars it feels less substantial it's a lot more uh, squishy if you will I don't particularly care for that on a personal level if I had to be completely honest Now, as a side note, I bought a 2100 in 1983, the fall of 83, I think it was. And I packed it into the bottom of this yarder block. And it gave me a bunch of grief, and I had to pack it out of the bottom of this yarder block. And then the next day, I packed it back in the bottom, and I had to turn around and pack it back out of there because it was not oiling properly. I did that three times in one week. I was fit to be tied and that's kind of one of the reasons when I'm building saws I'm not in some big fired up hurry I'm building them so that when they're done you don't get in the bottom of a yarder block and have to pack them back out of there I try to build things from a bulletproof perspective but here's the filter base molded 
kind of an interesting looking thing, kind of a uh, Jetsons looking situation here. And so it's fairly heavy for being all plastic. Z011 slash OAB Zamacarb. fly-by-wire situation seems to have a pretty small venturi in there actually if I was to take a guess it's it's pretty small for such a good size saw if you want to compare it to like an 044 or something it's way small um, diameter wise and we have it's encumbered uh, we ramp it up here and we ramp it over there in addition to squeezing it down as it's going through so we have less airflow and we have massive squish we already talked about that part if you want to take a look underneath this recoil assembly or pull starter cover i kind of actually do appreciate the sight lines being white i haven't used this saw that much and we're already kind of getting hammered on though with the paint they win it away from having the screw and the pivot screw the screw that holds the upper part of the recoil assembly and the and they're nice and captive that's good harder to lose anyway they don't have the pivot screw being sharing position with the other screw so then you're adding weight in that aspect um, the flywheels metal and it's pretty big in diameter compared to like some of the stuff we're seeing new. It's a one magnet system. So we have potential there. Uh, one thing that I did do and notice or notice when I was working on getting these dogs whipped into shape a little bit. Um, if we take a look inside right here, we see that. I'm assuming they're nylon, the chain guides, and I put the steel-esque chain catcher on there because they work better than anybody else's. Um, back on track, I was decidedly unimpressed that we use screws to hold these nylon, if they are nylon actually, what the material is I'm unsure of, chain guides onto the clutch cover. First of all, you're adding extra weight, and second of all, you're not going to be basically blowing your chain off too many times and you're going to be kind of having chain on screw and that equals dull more so than normal if we look at the dust flap it's uh not very big it's pretty narrow they have this little cup shaped thing engineered designed in whatever that is the antithesis of getting rid of chips in a hurry you want it canted away the old style steel um, clutch cover like industry standard for like 40 years or something stupid um, I don't know why you would want to put something I don't know if you can see it it's over an eighth of an inch it cups it's so it's cupping your chips um, you want it canted away if you're going to try to have good chip management. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So, several things on the clutch cover. They didn't get the memo, I guess. I don't know. Now, one thing that I noticed is the muffler was big. Um, it's got a big can on it. Kind of 5 Series esque in the way that it's shaped the cylinders canted back a little bit but not like the 562 now there's some speculation that echo poached some Husqvarna engineers or a Husqvarna engineer to help in the design process there's been two different
schools of thought show up in one of the threads there. Um, we're going to have a definite answer here shortly. But it's definitely a Husqvarna-esque style muffler. Six millimeter screws. But they don't use the little, I don't know what you want to call it, lock system that steel actually uses on there. So maybe that's why the Loctite is so impressive. interesting bracket system on the back side um, uh, yeah I don't know is this like a set of forks on a bike that has a brace to keep the forks from flexing a lot of extra monkey business and weight going on here um, I'm not sure why that's designed in like that So if we're going to take a look at the weights and measures part of this operation for a second, this is kind of like 088-esque, lots of extra monkey business. So about one and a half ounces or so. So about 40 grams of weight essentially. That's, is it really necessary? Why not make that magnesium cast solid and run screws down in there? Uh, acquiring minds, they kind of want to know. So there's your cooling plate. Now the 620 has this funky material on their cooling plates that basically also the gasket and so it's real similar on this thing. Um, you can see the whatever this material is right here it's like it welds itself to the metal. It just, it feels weird, it looks weird, but it's light. 12 grams or something like that. We look at the filter base, 20, 28 grams. The muffler itself, I'm going with this thing weighs like 300 and something. 380. So it's pretty heavy, all metal. It's too bad this wasn't stainless. That would have saved a lot of weight. We'll take a look and see what size a hole. They got an Eddie Munster haircut top of the outlet for the exhaust. huge screen and we'll get looking in there and see if we can check that out so the hole I don't know if you can see it in there is actually pretty good size but it's like it looks like yeah okay a tube I knew there was something going on in there so there's a little tube right there you can see it so it's about a half of an inch by about three-eighths of an inch or something maybe inside here there's a tube and it goes under and comes out so that doing a whoop-de-doo in there it's got a swoop de doo thing we'll have to get that whipped into shape 
And then before I forget, because I like to do that, it's got a really small diameter clutch drum, I noticed. Um, we kind of talked in some of the sawing tests about how it's it's got a funky feel to it. I've actually made uh, some progress. I stiffened up one of the operations for this spring mount system in this saw at this point. So it doesn't seem to be so flexy. Um, but I just... It like it hits hard on that thing. I wasn't overly impressed when I was operating it um, on a personal level. So they have a rubber boot or intake manifold that's holding it. Oh yeah, and I have my inspection gloves just in case too. Snicker, snicker, right? So they have the little metal ring keeping the intake manifold that's rubber from deforming, I guess, essentially under vacuum. That would be my guess. Now if we want to look underneath the hood, and then again you can see the we're fly-by-wire with the actuation of the throttle shutter and the carburetor. It's kind of interesting how they have the wire doing a little S curve right there. Just thought I better say something before I forget. On little cylinder, at least dimension wise, it's got a really good flywheel though, so it's probably pushing a lot of air. I know that the Dolmars. Their flywheel is pretty good size in diameter, so they're able to push a lot more air because they have more fins. And so, essentially, what you're dealing with at that point is you can have a little bit smaller cylinder if you're running more air across it and still achieve a favorable result of cooling. Now the 620 that I built, the base gasket on it was kind of haywire. I didn't really appreciate the material that they used. It was something similar to that exhaust. Cooling plate, sorry, I'm thinking. I'm looking, I'm observing. Okay, so They got a lot of volume in the crankcase right there, right below the transfer port circuit. Um, oh, this is kind of cool. triple looped on each side. Now you can see the size of the cap. I was looking at that and I was wondering what was going on in the back side of that operation. Um, and now we know. Well, now I know. But the start of the transfer port circuit isn't anything to write home about as far as size. Um, this style of cylinder is a lot less expensive to manufacture when you basically have caps over where the transfer ports are but if we look inside there we can see I'm not sure if you can't nope so this is running the back too it looks like and this big ones running just the single front one and elevation wise it looks like the front one is actually lower or higher depending on how you want to talk about it going down is actually going up but as the piston rolls down after it goes past top dead center it's actually opening in the front first now some of those smog saws like the 
461s and stuff like that, they have these funky shapes to them, and they're doing something similar as what we see here. If you want to talk about it just in a conceptual fashion. Um, the combustion chamber is uh, like a three-stage valve job. It comes across, drops in, and then drops in again. So the squish band is really narrow on that outside edge, maybe an eighth of an inch. Then you got another band that's about three-eighths of an inch or so, maybe quarter. And then it drops into the actual combustion chamber. It doesn't look very big. Um, pretty good sized process coming in through the intake track though so that means there's potential and we actually have a massive opening on the back side of the port for the exhaust now they have a reversion dam system going on in there I can see the little lip that's kind of cool interesting cool they have this bracket right here this piece that's cast that's actually supporting the muffler thought that was kind of interesting it's similar to what we see in uh, 7900 Dolmar saws they have kind of a situation of a lot of beef up in the front because their muffler isn't held to the cases those early ones uh, so now we're gonna check out and see what we have diameter wise that 51 millimeter concept that has been spoken of seems to be the reality and it is 50.92 essentially so I would bet at that point to get to that 73 and a half which I don't know why they didn't round up to an even number but you're gonna have a 36 millimeter stroke so there is that aspect of it Okay, so those are held in by the clamp right there. Okay, good. So if we look at, we're going round and in a really short distance we're going oblong. Um, we're trying to directionalize the flow a little bit as it's going through the process there. It's got a little bit of a indentation right just inside there about halfway. But this thing that goes around this manifold is really interesting probably does all right with dissipating heat if you got air going across it but you're going to get stuff plugging up in those shrouds right there back on track with the cylinder it's really wide but it's really small let's check it out on weight i guess Six hundred and ten grams or eleven grams it says. Now I know that the four sixty two saw it's an air injection machine, which this is not. This is old school. That cylinder weighs like seven hundred and sixty grams or something like that, and the five seventy two cylinder weighs like eight hundred and it's 800 and something, I can't remember, 840 or 50 or 70 or something. It's like getting close to two pounds, essentially. This is a little tiny cylinder, and it doesn't have a lot of surface area, so they must be blowing a lot of air across the top with the big diameter flywheel with a lot of fins on it. We'll take a look at that real quick. Um... Pretty good size diameter metal. Now we have twin rings, so we're trying to get a lot of compression. We have one that's just offset. They don't appear to be super thick rings, though. And then one offset up here, so they're trying to keep a lot of compression from, or they're trying to keep the compression from blowing by the rings, essentially. But the piston's really odd looking. Um,
if I was to talk about the casting, it's it's kind of ugly looking. It I mean it's unfinished. It's unfinished looking, I guess. Um, but it's open, which is not normal. Right in these two areas right here so they're getting some flow to come through there that's not a normal thing generally this is all solid in here on pistons so maybe this is some super awesome special unobtainium type material but they don't have very big windows for letting much flow get through there there the rod is actually pretty big looking um the bearing I don't know if you can see that. I'm hoping you can see that it's real narrow, though, at the top. Um, so the bearing isn't very wide. I'm hoping that it's big in diameter. Now we want to take a look at thickness. We have 46 thousandths, so they're 1.2, so they're not super thin by any stretch of the imagination. pushing device here we go uh, looks like they have a big diameter wrist pin um, not super big in diameter like what we've seen some of the Husqvarna stuff so that's going to be probably 15 to 17 maybe even 18 uh, 16 so it's fairly lightweight. I want to look at the piston itself as a whole unit. 94. That's not super awesomely impressive. If you want to look at like a 288, they displace almost 88 cc's, essentially 87.9, I think it is. And they have a piston with one ring that weighs 80. They weigh 80 grams, I think it is. In other words, they're a lot lighter, whatever. Uh, super cool, though. They have holes in the bottom of the bosses so that the wrist pin is getting some lubrication. That's super awesome right there. I'm curious about this bearing. No, it's not a big diameter, but it does have a lot of needle bearings. They have recesses in the top along with holes allowing for lubrication this would be like what's in a 461 you can see spacing looks like it's about the same with the number but it has little recesses in there to help it carry oil. Five grams versus five grams. So that's kind of interesting. But we have a lot of storage available in the crankcase right below the start of the transfer port circuit where it's best. 12 millimeter too, I think I forgot to mention that part. Um, 
And so there you go. We kind of like took a look at this thing and on a personal level, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, if I was to talk about improvement, kind of a weird little casting flaw in that piston right there. Oh, it's the back side of the pin. It almost looks like they run the pin in at a diagonal this way, but it's open on this side, maybe. That's interesting. Usually they're closed or captive in there. But you can see how rough it is. Um, it's pretty rough in there looking. And it's pretty heavy. But I think it's got potential. Okay, so we managed to get her torn down. We talked about a few things. Um, the squish is huge on that thing. Probably the major reason at this elevation it's struggling so bad. I don't see any way that this saw could ever run with um, some of the other saws that are out there without being uh, altered, heavily altered, let's say, based on what I'm seeing here. So... Maybe we should take a look underneath this cap real quick and see what's going on in there. Husqvarna has some caps like this on some of their 5 series saws, but they use more screws to hold the cap down, so I wonder why that is other than it's more secure. Rule number one, no max torque when you're taking something apart for the first time until you figure out what makes it tick. Lest you be buying something brand new. They definitely don't want you getting in there. I'm assuming there's some kind of an O-ring situation in there. Okay, I think we're going to have to put this thing in the vise so we can hold it and kind of work out those cap. It's nice and slow like. Okay, so I had made an assumption based on what I saw with the Husqvarna stuff. This one was actually glued in there and we see that the glue had actually like gone over to where it could actually get in the cylinder. But if we take the cap off, definitely has an interesting shape to it. There's a lot of potential in this operation for something that's going to work right. They must have used something like Yama Bond or something in here, a toxic waste in a tube, I guess, to glue the cap on there. But like I said, I was trying to be careful so I didn't actually wreck the thing. Um, because you just never know like what you're up against, I guess, essentially. So, funky shapes, just kind of an interesting concept. Um, but do I think it's going to run in the end? Yeah, I think it's going to run in the end. Is it going to be awesome? I'm kind of actually thinking it might be awesome. So... Maybe my NBFF might just, I don't even know, like, I don't, I don't know, maybe it got lost in the mail or something like that, you never know. I guess we'll see how things turn out, won't we? 
anyway, so we kind of looked at everything stem to stern in a way, except we didn't look at the clutch. Maybe we should do that real quick, because I haven't seen one of these myself yet either. And just take a look and see what's underneath the hood on that clutch drum there, see how she fares. Oh, it's got an interesting clutch with big springs in it. The clutch drum bearing is minuscule. And it's really open. The cool thing about this, though, you got to give them kudos for that. Which is like, I don't know why some of the pro saw, especially steel that uses a plastic or some kind of a polyamide cage for their clutch drum bearing. We're going to look at something here real quick. There you go. That's the best thing since sliced bread right there. You can grease that bearing. You can grease that bearing five times a day if you wanted to. That is a really awesome operation right there. I carried one of these when I was a young punk. First started falling logs, or falling trees, but cutting logs, essentially making logs out of trees that hit the ground because they were dead now. Um, I used to pack one of those in my camp all the time. Every every day, at the end of the day, I would grease that bearing. Uh, and then I kind of got lazy as I got older, after 20, 30 years or whatever. And so, <laughs> I never really noticed where it was that big of a deal. Except you do see those steel clutch drum bearings kind of go out because that cage is uh, some kind of a composite polyamide nylon I don't know what it is but this clutch is actually pretty good beefy looking but it's kind of a narrow narrow situation but it's small but the pads are kind of kind of big though they got some beef behind them so one of the other things that I need to kind of segue off on just for a second since I noticed it as I was eyeballing down inside the crankcase is the rod is really beef. Um, it's thick at the top where it encases the wrist pin bearing. The, it's thick. It's thick in the web section right here. And the throws on the crank are actually really beef too. Um, I thought that was kind of cool. They got a steel vibe to them with the funky different design at the top. Um, and we better take a look at what kind of cage we're dealing with since there seems to be some scuttlebutt on what the cage material is. It looks like it's steel to me, but I can't be positive. They got a steel color that almost looks like plastic, though, or what I like to call polyamide. Yeah, I, I think it is polyamide, actually. The cages are polyamide in these bearings. Now, one of the things you got to think about with a polyamide cage is if something cuts loose in there, you might be able to go through your engine and not cause a catastrophic explosion. I actually had hard surfacing come off of a 266 back in... Uh, late 80s it was a 89 or something like that I think it was and I've had some cages cut loose and some other saws that were metal and it's always been catastrophic um, so I just thought I'd make mention of that while we were on the discussion topic and it, I guess if we're kind of in the realm of taking a look at this crankcase operation, we see how the base gasket is webbed. It's, suppri it's supporting the bottom of the base because it's actually a pretty good size for such a small cylinder. And in my mind, I kind of went, why weren't they thinking about relieving some of the material in there and like dropping some weight? Um, this thing's a little bit on the heavy side for the displacement and uh, power output, but we've kind of discussed why there are issues with some of the saws out there here and there, and this one specifically, 
is dealing with a squish band that's uber impressive. Okay, so this saw is finalized as far as the zip kit. This gentleman, my NBFF, wanted to go all the way, so Psycho SS. Um, there seems to be some confusion on the process. I always kind of compare saws. Sometimes they're one stock one versus one zip one for a comparison. Sometimes there's two zip ones for a comparison as well. I try to do my best to apply the same amount of pressure when we're going through the motions of cutting the cookies off. Um, but I'm only human. Sometimes you're going to be a little, there'll be some variance, let's just say that. So, as I was going through the process, I kind of started thinking after I started, after I was in the middle of trying to make this thing run better. Um, but back on the confusion aspect, if we want to talk about, I'm not even sure. So, there's a lot of scuttlebutt on the internet, I guess. I didn't do any research on this saw, really. I, I did a little bit, kind of some weights and some other monkey business overview stuff, but I didn't really check it out too heavily before I started running it because I didn't want to have a jaded opinion. I just wanted to run the thing and then check it out. So, um, this is probably going to be at the end. This video was long. Um, we're going to reference some things. You're going to have to go back and take a look um, when we start talking about the carburetor because I don't have the carburetor. It's installed. Um, one thing I did want to do though is compare a 372, not an X torque carburetor either, saw. And so if we want to take a look at the air cleaners for a second, so cartridge style, but there's a lot more surface area on this one. This one comes out of the 7310. This is a 372. But if we look at the inside, we can see the amount of air that's available or can actually travel is over half again as much. I don't know if I'd say it's twice as much as what we see in the 7310, but it's half again as much at the very minimum, more capacity available when necessary. So right out of the gate, we got a big air restriction. Now, like I said, there seems to be some confusion in the process. Whenever you have air restriction, airflow impedance, you're not gonna have good performance because you need the air to go through the venturi and then get atomized with the fuel and then get into the process so right out of the gate this saw is down on airflow um, it's the same kind of a small hole going into the elbow and then the venturi or well the start of the carburetor we're going to take a look we'll do a little drawing here you know my artwork so we kind of looked at that carburetor a little bit. I don't know if you could actually see it the way they designed it. The metering needle itself, the cavity actually protruded into the venturi. So the venturi in this saw is shaped kind of like this. Um, not very straight right there. And the outside of the carburetor is like this. And the choke lever is kind of got a weird shape to it. And it kind of goes like this. And then it goes around. And what happens is there's a step. We can kind of see it a little bit. There's a step right here. It's very short between the outside edge of the opening and where the step comes up. And it basically goes like this, mirrors this. So when the choke is closed, the choke is resting right here. So, I kind of talked about that a little bit in the video. We're talking a weeks, it's several weeks ago now that I actually shot that video. So, I'm trying to go by memory here a little bit. But, essentially, this is not conducive to good airflow, this shape right here. Round is a good 
shape for airflow, water flow. Rectangular is not as good as square um, in most instances. This kind of half moon shape looking thing is not as nice as what we see if we want to take a look at. The 372 is round in there. It's like a Venturi should be shaped. So what we have is more available volume for airflow and we actually have a bigger hole that goes into the start of the carburetor itself. Um, strike two on the 7310. Now I don't have an intake manifold hanging around but the hole in the manifold for the 372 is actually larger than what we see in the 7310. Uh, strike number three for airflow. Once we get inside there, we were kind of looking at some stuff I mentioned. The squish was like, um, I think it was 61.5, but I had some buildup on the top of the piston, so it might be around 62 thousandths. I'm not even sure you can call that squish. Um, the turbulence factor that's happening when the piston's coming up to compress the mixture of air and fuel to basically get it to a state where it'll uh, be really volatile and uh, ignite quickly it's not it's not a good thing in this saw um, a lot of saws are running between 40 and oh some of them a standard operating procedure down around 29 or 28 or something depends on the saw they vary a little bit I've noticed between uh, saws in the actual model they'll vary one or two thousandths that's fairly consistent um so anyway on top of the piston it has this like textured feel you probably can't see that but it's a little textured right here so that's an interesting concept this saw doesn't have any smog um design we're not stratifying with exhaust like in the one series um Steel saws, we're not stratifying with raw air like what we see in some of the auto-tune and some of the Mtronic saws. This saw, what they've done to it is try to get this thing to burn clean. That's the major consideration is to get the thing to burn clean. They did not do uh, make power. That's not the major consideration in the design. This thing has three loops for the transfer port system coming out on both sides and that was amazingly bad um it's it's not really designed to flow a lot of air now if we look at the exhaust the muffler itself um the 372 muffler i don't have one of those that you can actually see and so we're going to have to just draw now where on the back side of the port for the exhaust, both the 7310 and the 372 share a common oblong shape for the port. So it's kind of like this. They're actually pretty close to the same size too. So we're basically even at that point. Once we go into the muffler, the 372, the muffler can might be a little bit smaller, but it's kind of um, a little more shaped like a cubed. The 7310 is a little bit uh, bulbous down in the front. It's kind of constricted where it comes in. First gets, when the exhaust first gets into the muffler, and then it kind of opens up as it goes down. But what happens inside the 372 is inside underneath the outlet there's a round hole now we talked about round holes flowing exhaust better than rectangles or squares what we see in the 7310 so the exhaust let's go back for a second so the exhaust comes in the muffler of the 372 it's looping around and it's coming back up and coming out and then it's going into the outlet so the hole is like this this hole is here and then there's the fire screen 
so the muffler is basically shaped like this so the exhaust comes in and has to go out and then make a corner okay but it has a hole in there I'm hoping you can see all this I can't tell because I'm not watching I'm trying to draw if we look at what happens in the 7310 itself the muffler like I said it kind of opens up but it's kind of a little bit bulbous down in the front so the exhaust has to come in and go around and it has to come out but it's going through and it's doing an S corner in there so essentially the outlets are kind of similar although the outlet for the 7310 is actually wider it's diffusing the exhaust a little bit better before it's let out into the wilds if you will but there's a little kind of a little mini half tube in here and so if we look at it like we were looking in this direction it's shaped like this and then it if we look at it like we're looking at it from the side it kind of we can see it a little bit but basically this is enclosed so the exhaust has to go in here make a corner and then come back out uh, that's strike number four as far as flow so at least with the 372 it just only has to basically come out and come up and blow out it's not really having to get clear around and then make a sharp s corner because this distance here is really narrow it's kind of a little bit more wide but it's real narrow so the exhaust has to get clear up follow a path and then make a tight s corner and go out um i don't even know what to say there's so many issues with actual if you just look at it from the performance aspect only um, it was designed to burn clean without being stratified with either raw air or exhaust which helps the hydrocarbon emissions factor be less okay so we talked about some of the rest of that now on a personal level with the way people are with computer these days it could be one of those situations where uh, after a certain amount of runtime there's a little switch inside this control module which is located right here on this saw the coil and it flips a little switch in there and then all of a sudden it changes the curve and the saw will actually do a little bit better I'm not saying that that's not a possibility what I'm saying is the way the port timing is done in this particular saw and and add in the uh, restricted flow coming in and going out it doesn't matter what happens with the spark it might run a little bit better now the other side of the equation is once this thing gets broken in it might possibly run a little bit better I've never seen a saw that doesn't um, some saws are more extreme than others it just depends some of the older saws seem like they would do a little bit better with the uh, it came alive once it reached that sweet spot turn the corner whatever however you want to reference that broken in and they run a little bit better some of the newer saws they are a little more subtle in when they hit that particular threshold now we kind of talked about the air cleaner but we didn't talk about what was going on inside underneath okay so I looked at this a little bit further and reached the conclusion that this is the plellum if you will it's not pressurized like what we see in a 562 it's it's just not and so essentially as the starter side is the flywheel essentially is spinning it creates a vacuum a low pressure area right here and it draws air in and then it the fins basically start stuffing it out this direction because the engine's spinning at a high rate of speed now this cavity right here is on the back side of this little shroud right here and it's inside of that plum area and it comes out right here so what's happening is there's air being drawn out of this 
volume area right here where the air cleaner sits because it's basically this little 90 degree I don't know what you call this thing little band right here that's in the filter base flange probably fits right in here so it's basically drawing air out of this area here so they we're dealing with negative pressure instead of positive pressure in there um, that's going to be part of the that's probably strike five I guess if you want to talk about air flow um, if you're just stuffing it in there and maybe you have a small place like some of the new steel saws have changed their process there's a little tiny hole where you know some of the excess can escape some of the dirt water whatever um, this is actually being drawn out though so we're pulling air from inside this cavity at the same time we're catching some of the pressure off of the fins and we're stuffing air in right here into this shroud that's molded on there it looks like and then it basically it's stuffing the air into this cavity where the air filter resides and so we have a little bit of a a whirlwind effect if you will it's a circular pattern now unfortunately because of the draw coming out on the flywheel side like I said it's a negative situation here it's not a positive pressure area so um, well it could be a little bit of a positive pressure area but it's not like we have pressure going in and not really trying to draw the air back out they're trying to uh, keep the air clean essentially they're cleaning it twice essentially in the process they're blowing the big chunks off and then they're blowing it through and they're swirling it around and they're gonna centrifugal force is gonna it's centripetal technically it's gonna be forcing any of the dust particles to go to the outside and then they're gonna get drawn back out through this cavity here and then back through so it's kinda making a circuit if you will so I'm gonna Splice this into the end. It's just, I know it's super long. Um, I'm going to do the sign off thing. I think that's already done in the other video, but like, I don't even know what to say. Oh, one more thing that we need to address because there's definitely a lack of understanding. It's just, I don't know how else to term it. Sorry, guys. There's a lack of understanding by some people out there that have never worked at elevation with a chainsaw. Um, 661 animatronic saws we're at 2800 feet right here i can tell they're starting to struggle when the temperature gets up above about 70 definitely you know at 80 they're kind of struggling um due to all the airflow encumbrances the bad port timing the super lame squish that this saw has it's not going to run good at elevation it's not going to because it can't um, it's got it has too many design flaws in the process of getting the air in having it go through the combustion process and then getting it out um, we look at some of those other saws the 044 that this saw didn't win against that's half clapped out they have a bigger venturi they have uh, hold the, the systems better straight shot from the air cleaner goes down it doesn't have to make a corner that doesn't help uh, performance either when the air has to actually make a corner uh, we're not really canted back very far but we are canted back a little bit the steel saws are canted back a little bit further so that's making the um, air go into the crankcase a little bit better uh, there's a lot of volume in the crankcase the rod is really big I think I mentioned that it's pretty beefy back on the elevation thing it's you get a buy till about a thousand feet it seems like anywhere from zero to a thousand seems like it's not really noticeable you can maybe kind of notice a little bit from there up to about three thousand it seems like three thousand is like kind of the end of the process and then after that it's five hundred to a thousand you're definitely noticing after about four thousand it starts to be definitely a five hundred foot increment notice where you can tell you're 500 feet higher in the sky and it just keeps getting worse and it's a curve that's going like this um, it starts out pretty good at a thousand and it's dropping gradually and the further you go up in elevation the further that drop-off is for available air 
in a chainsaw, any kind of an engine. So I think there's confusion on that aspect. Um, like I said, unless you've worked at elevation three to seven, eight, nine thousand, a guy really doesn't have a good understanding. It's just the way it is. Um, it's unfortunate. It's it's kind of an eye opener. I wish more people that make a lot of comments about stuff would spend a little bit more time cutting at four to eight thousand feet. They'd find things to be a lot more different than the zero to one uh, fifteen hundred, let's say. Um, so that's my kind of take on why this saw struggles in kind of an overview session why it struggles at elevation and especially when it's hot um, it's designed to burn kind of clean with the port timing and the whole muffler situation in this process and so that's not helping performance whatsoever so I'm gonna splice this in it's probably gonna be ill received by some it'll be well received by others because we're just adding to the mix of why things are the way that they are in the process. Again, lousy squish. I think this is the worst I've ever seen in a chainsaw. That does not help performance. We have bad airflow characteristics in and out. Um, that is not helping performance. The Venturi, not only is it have a architecturally um, deficient, inefficient, inefficient shape, it's small. It's just stem to stern, we were having flow issues. So that's why she's performing poorly in stock form at elevation. There's, it's the physics of the situation. You can't get away from it. You can't get around it, at least in stock form. I think she's going to run nicely. I'm super hopeful that what I've done in here is going to make this thing come alive and she's going to be really moving right along and we're going to be doing that shortly so anyway there's my take on why this saw uh, struggles around this location performance wise we looked at a lot of stuff I said interesting numerous times in this little session that we looked at this saw it wasn't I guess it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be um, there's not an excess of nuts and bolts in this process. I thought that was kind of cool. I guess we're going to have to put the herd on it now that it's on the operating table and see what we get as a result in this process. So, long-winded, but first exposure, I was curious kind of wanted to look at it in detail a little bit so with that being said thanks for watching this session have a blessed day wherever you might be on God's green earth and thanks my friend and BFF for sending this over so I can do a little show-and-tell session <laughs>